Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Is everybody good? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, come on in this morning. Hello. Bright and early. Here we are. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Very good morning to you. Um, hope everybody's waking up well this morning. It's a brand new day. And uh, we get to do it with God. So it's definitely something to be joyful about there. I want to invite you to grab your notepads, your notebooks. What's the correct term in South Africa? Is it notepads or notebooks? Doesn't even matter. Grab your exercise book. Yeah, I'm gonna stop saying notepad. Grab your exercise books. <laughs> grab your, your notepads. There's quite a lot of scripture references I'm gonna be giving throughout. I don't want you to be too fixated on finding it immediately, maybe because of just the pace that we're moving at, so that we can cover everything. Um, so I do want you to write them down. I do want you to write them down uh, so that in your own personal devotion, we say this and teach it every time. Even if you go to church on Sunday and you take notes, it's not so that your notepad can fill up and you can say at the end of the year, I've finished another notepad. No so that you can go back that you can go back and, and go read in your own time in your own pace uh, what you've written in your exercise books i love that i love exercise books hmm? that we go and we exercise you go back and you study it you know in your exercise books you've got notes you go back to your notes you add on to your notes you really believe that um, there's nothing that the holy spirit will reveal to us teach us make us aware of that um, he, he is not highly invested on sharing with you. So if you're on your journey to learning and you know, uh, to separating time for devotion, your exercise book becomes very important. So I want to encourage you that when you go to church, don't believe the hype. You know, I've got a photo drinking. I've got a photographic memory. You know, I can just sit there and I can hear everything. That's great for you. We wish you all the best. Write down your notes. Oh, yeah, write your notes down. You know, yeah, I can just hear it once and I know it. Oh, yeah, write your notes down. You know, you know get into the habit of um, taking notes, making notes. And, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I get into the habit of, of taking down notes and, um, and, and just going back to them you know going back to them if somebody says something you're like is this in scripture let me go find it in the scripture go back to it so i want to encourage you not just for bible study for church if you're watching a sermon on youtube if you uh, write down and revisit write down revisit write down revisit and watch the holy spirit reveal even more that makes sense this morning all right. It's an absolute pleasure to have you this morning. Welcome to Jesus This, Jesus That prayer in the morning. We meet like this at 6 a.m. Last night we had a fab time in the Word. It was Bible study from 7 o'clock. And today we pick up and we run with it. Uh, just some of the lessons that we learned yesterday, some of the things that stood out. And the big mission today is to start to put what we've learned into our vocab. What do we mean? We use the word of God as our vocabulary. It's our language to communicate. It's our language that we do life with. So this morning, we're going to spend a bit of time praying, you and I. So you didn't come to watch a live. In fact, you can put your phone down. You don't even have to see my crusty face, okay? You can literally put it there. As long as you can hear, uh, I'm happy. As long as you can follow through, I'm happy. Uh, what's the aim for you to be opening up your mouth to pray this morning? Um, so I don't want anybody to be a spectator. I want us all to be fully participating this morning. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We're excited together in this manner. And Father, we pray that this will be a fruitful time for all of us. Thank you, Lord God, that you are faithful even in this time. That, Father, we are up bright and early. We start the day with you. And we're here at your table to feast. Speak, Lord. We are listening. Let our ears be quick to hear you. Let our hands and feet be quick to do and go in the direction that you ask us to go. And we pray, Lord God, that this will be a fruitful time for everyone that is logged on here, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, against any form of distraction, anything that will make our minds wander, anything that will want to steal from this time with you. Lord God, we set aside this time intentionally to spend with you. We set aside this time intentionally to hear you. We set this time intentionally, Lord God, to commune with you. Therefore, Lord God, we pray that nothing will take away this um, opportunity from us in Jesus Christ's name. We're excited. We've come expectant. And Lord God, we've come with uh, um, the mind to participate this morning. The mind to participate this morning. Come on, just pray that over yourself this morning. That Father, I participate. Hey Lord, I haven't spoken to you in a while, but I participate. You know, it's been a bit tricky in the past couple of days. I haven't been able to speak to you in the way that I usually do. But at this morning, I participate. I, I want you to, to commit yourselves to participating. That as God's word is spoken, that you receive it. That it lands on fertile soil. That it doesn't start to germinate tomorrow. It starts to germinate today. We place a demand on the word of God coming to fruition of the word of God being made manifest in our lives today that it's our word today that we receive it today we comprehend it today and we participate today now we say this all the time here at bible study that it doesn't matter where you are I haven't gone to church in a while that's good we're glad you're here and we pray that you go to church on sunday <laughs> you know, I haven't spoken to God in a while. I've been angry at him. We're so happy that you're here today. Ooh, Rorosan, if only you knew what I've been up to the past couple of weeks and the things that I've done. I'm not sure God is willing to hear him, to hear me. Yeah. Well, we've come to tell you that he is readily available, not only to hear you, but to speak to you this morning. Doesn't matter where you are. It's important that he is here. He is here. He is here. And for that, we thank you, oh Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. In Jesus Christ, we pray. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Uh, all right, let's get those exercise books ready. Let's get those exercise books ready. We had it. Please go ahead and choose a friend. There is about um, just a little under 3,000 of us here this morning. Probably more will join us. It's um, a great opportunity. But again, just for a second, imagine we were in an auditorium and there were 3,000 people gathered. And you had the opportunity to turn around and pray with someone. We're going to do it virtually this morning. I want you to go ahead and tag a friend. Uh, that's on this live scroll up and down find a name that jumps at you and I want you to pray with them It's not so much about you tagging them even later. You can send them a DM Just let them know that you're praying with them um, But we're gonna pray Have you found a friend? Have you found a friend? Go ahead and find a friend this morning. Go ahead and find a friend this morning Come on. This should excite us. This is this is the exciting bit where we get to exercise this God-given gift, this God-given privilege, the ability for us to stand in the gap for somebody else. The ability for us to stand in the gap for somebody else. Find a friend this morning. Find a friend this morning. Find a friend this morning. 
And this is what I want you to pray over them. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And, and maybe let me put it like this. Um, we take for granted how many people don't function on joy. A lot of people function on happiness. And happiness is dependent on happenings. Something happened that led me to feel happiness. But the joy of the Lord is a gift. It's, it's something that God gives us. That's why the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's not subject to circumstances. And, and sometimes we take for granted the, the absolute dire need for us to live from joy. Live from God's strength. And this morning, I want us to pray over our friends. Psalms 118, verse 24. 118, verse 24. And it reads as follows. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hmm. And it says the beauty of the day is not that it is new, but that we are being made new. The beauty of the day is not that it is new. There was a new day yesterday. There's going to be a new day tomorrow. In the next two weeks, there'll be a new day. In the next three years, there'll be a new day. So the beauty of the day is not that the day is new. It's not that experiencing a new day is new, but that we are being made new. You and I are being made new. You and I are being given another opportunity. You and I are seeing God's goodness. You and I are seeing his mercies. You and I are experiencing his love. You and I are walking in joy with him. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is what I want you to pray over your friend. You're declaring that this is the day that the Lord has made. Yes, the devil is probably maneuvering something right about now. Yes, you know, the people around them may trying to manipulate situations. Yes, there could be people who have bad intentions towards them. Yes, the devil is a liar. He could wake up this morning and want to steal their lives. Yes, but we want to declare that in actual fact, and make an announcement that this is the day that the Lord has made. If this is the day that the Lord has made, it means the day belongs to God. Come on, you're praying that this day belongs to God. Concerning you, this day belongs to God. Everything that has to do with this day is ordered and unctioned by God. Anything that's outside of what God has planned for you, set apart from you. It has no right to function or prevail. The day belongs to God. Then the second thing you're going to pray for them is that let them rejoice. Speak joy over them. That I declare joy over you. I declare that praises come out of your mouth. I declare that goodness and mercy follows you. Thus your mouth will never cease to give God praise I declare that you will be glad in this day. I declare that you will find things to count as goodness and as joy and as mercy, that your eyes will not fail to see God's goodness. Therefore, his gladness will fill up your heart. This day belongs to God. Everything concerning you, this day belongs to God. Come on, let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come and stand in agreement this morning that this day belongs to you. Concerning my friend, come on, say their name. Concerning my friend, this day belongs to you. I declare, Lord God, that as they start this day, that, Father, their mouths will be filled with rejoice and gladness as they wake up to go to work, as they wake up to look for work, as they wake up to go to school, as they wake up to prepare their families, as they wake up to fend for their families, everything concerning this day. Lord God, we speak your joy over it. We are joyful because this day belongs to you. Come on, tell them as they step out of their bed, this day belongs to them. As their body gets strengthened, if they were sick, this day belongs to God. 
And therefore we declare that indeed they will rejoice. Indeed they will be glad in this day. In their health they will be glad and rejoice. Now come on, in their mental health they will be glad and rejoice. In their work life they will be glad and rejoice. In their family life they will be glad and rejoice. In their business and their meetings and their deadlines and their career, they will be glad and rejoice. That there is no area of their lives where they will not find an area to be glad and to rejoice in, in the mighty name of Jesus' name. The mighty name of Jesus. Come on, speak that over them this morning. This day belongs to God. Devil, you have no right over this day. Everything concerning to this day, this day belongs to God. This is the day that the Lord has made. The day belongs to God. The day belongs to God. And Father, as we start this day this morning, we declare it as yours. We are grateful for the privilege that we're able to step into anything that you have made. And as we wake up this morning to face this day, as we wake up this morning to start this day, as we wake up this morning to live out purpose in this day, we rejoice over the fact that this day was made by you. Every intricate part of this day, <coughs> you know. <coughs> every dealing of this day, you know. Every minute, every second of this day was made by you. Therefore, Lord God, we pray your joy carries us through in the mighty name of Jesus Christ <clears throat> in the mighty name of Jesus Christ amen amen I have this fan heater that is <laughs> blocking my nose um But me and her must get into agreement that we're going to make it through this life. I want to welcome you again to Bible study, or prayer rather, this morning. Yesterday we were looking at Luke 7. Luke chapter 7, we were looking at verses 36, and we took it all the way to verses 50. Or verses 49, but you can just sort of finish it off. It's the last bit of Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And, and what we see here is an interaction happening between Jesus, Pharisee, and what a, the Bible calls an immoral woman. And we, we know, according to this part of scripture, that on this particular day, this Pharisee had invited Jesus over for dinner. And that Jesus was there to eat. Then in verse 37, it says, when a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Verse 38 she then knelt before him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. She kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Verse 39 says, the Pharisee saw this and he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman was touching him. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answers his thoughts and says, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. A man had loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces of silver to another. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debt. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Who do you suppose loved the master more after that? Simon responds and says, I suppose the one whom he canceled a larger debt. Then Jesus says something profound. He says, That's right. 
Then he turned to the woman and said, look at this woman kneeling. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash my dust off the feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time that I was here and she came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you this, she sins or she has sins or she's a sinner. She has many of these sins, but I have forgiven her. She has shown me much love, but the person who is forgiven a little shows very little love. The person who's been forgiven a little shows very little love. So Jesus illustrates here that the one who's been forgiven the most, the one who carries the most is the one who's more likely to be more grateful is more likely the one who would come to God and say, Lord, thank you. How do I love you? How do I show you appreciation? How do I honor you? How do I lay at your feet? And there's a couple of prayer points that I want us to go through this morning. And I think the greater lesson here is oftentimes we forget how much we've been forgiven and that's sometimes translates in how we interact with God. How we show love. Jesus says, the one who's been forgiven a little oftentimes gives a little love. Gives a little honor. Gives a little bit of disobedience. Gives, gives the bare minimum. It's the one who's been forgiven greatly who often comes and pours out their all. Because they know that they were dead. They know that without God, they are nothing. Therefore, the little bit that they have, they want to give all to him. Because they understand what he has done for them. I want you to look at verse 36. So Jesus went to his house. The Bible tells us that the Pharisee had invited Jesus. And Jesus went to his home, sat down to eat. He said yesterday, when the woman walks in, Jesus wasn't there to perform miracles. Jesus wasn't there to necessarily teach. That Jesus was there as a guest who was invited to come and have dinner. But we said that when she arrives, she gets ministered to by Jesus. He's always on the clock. He's never too busy for you. I want to speak to the concept of invitation in two ways here today. And I want you to write these two scriptures down. And if you can quickly open them, I'll be glad. It's Revelations 3.20. Revelations chapter 3 verse 20. I also want you to write down Matthew 7 verse 7 and 8. So Matthew 7.7. 7, Matthew 7 chapter 7 verse 7 and 8 or well, you could just write it as Matthew 7 7 and I want us to speak about this concept of invitation Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 reads as follows ask and it shall be given seek and you shall find knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone that asks, receives. He that seeks, finds. And he that knocks the door shall be open to. I don't know about you, but something kind of struck a chord in me when I realized that the Pharisee invited Jesus and Jesus came. Mm. He, he, he invited Jesus and Jesus came. Jesus honored the invitation. And I think most of us go through our lives and we, we don't invite God. Or maybe you think that your sins are too great so he won't come. I love that he asked Jesus to come and he came. I wonder if we were to dare ask him to come into our lives this morning, what would take place? If we were there to invite him in our businesses, in our marriages, 
in the raising of our children, in our careers, in the seeking of promotion, in the decisions that we make. I, I wonder what would take place if we invited him. You see, oftentimes when we look at Matthew 7, we get excited at the ask and you shall be given because we use it as a tool to get what we want out of Christ. So I asked you for a promotion, therefore I shall receive it. But I love that it doesn't stop at the asking, but it speaks of seeking. It speaks of a, a genuine pursuit of something or someone. So I didn't come just to ask for things from you. I came to seek you out. I'm on a pursuit of you. I stand and I knock because I want to enter into your dwelling place. I want to be where you are. I want to be in your presence. If I knock at the door of your house, I'm not just doing an activity of creating a sound. I am asking for permission to dwell in your dwelling place, to be where you are, to have your attention, to sit with you to commune with you to be in your presence i i wonder if we were to ask and to seek and knock i wonder if we were to bring petitions before the lord and not just stop there but also seek him out seek he first the kingdom of god and the rest shall be added unto you. I wonder if there is a seeking, a desire in our hearts to know him more, to want him more, to desire for him more, to pursue him. I seek you out. I wonder if there's a desire to knock at the door, to, 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 to be where he is. It's Revelations 3.20. And Jesus says to us, I am here. He, he makes it clear where his location is. He is not hiding away from us. He's not dicking and diving and, and, and playing hide and seek. No, he says, I am here. And he says, I stand at the door and I knock. I stand at the door and I knock. I, I wonder if we would open the door this morning. Oh, I dare you to pray this morning that more than your hand, it's your heart I seek. More than the things you can do for me, it's your presence I seek. The woman comes in uninvited and she falls at his feet. She is desperately in need of proximity. She is desperately in need of access. Oh, she is in desperate need of, 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 of being where he is. She doesn't open up her mouth to ask for anything. She simply comes to his feet, cries out her heart and pours perfume on his feet, worships him. She, she, she takes full advantage of being in his presence. She, she cries and she wipes his feet with her hair. She pours out the oil and the perfume on his feet. She kisses his feet continuously worshiping him. She seeks him out. The Bible says when she heard that he was there, she goes over, she seeks him out. And when she arrives, she doesn't just stand there to look at him. She, she, she comes by his feet. I dare you to pray this morning that, Lord, not only do I ask, but I want to seek you out. I want to pursue you. I want to knock at the door of your presence and I want to come in and dwell. Can we pray that this morning? Come, let's pray. Ooh, dear Heavenly Father, come on. I remember, we're not here to watch. We're here to pray. We're not here to watch. We're here to pray. We're not here to watch. We're here to pray. We're not here to watch. We're here to pray. We're not here to watch. We're here to pray. 
come on, I want you to pray it over your life. That Father, I seek you out. I make an effort to read your word. I make an effort to spend time with you. I make an effort to be interested in the things that make your heart smile. I make an effort to commune with you daily. I make an effort to living out a holy and righteous life. I make an effort to seek you out. Come on, pray. I knock at the door of your presence and I want to come in and dwell. I don't want to be found anywhere where you are not. Wherever you are is where I want to be. Come on. I want your spirit man this morning to acknowledge Revelations 3.20. Yeah, sometimes I'm lazy to pray. Sometimes I'm lazy to read his word. Sometimes I'm disobedient. Sometimes... I go with what the flesh wants. Come, remind your spirit man that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And he that is in me says, I am here. And I stand at the door and I knock. And come on, I want you to boldly declare that, Father, I open up that door. I walk in boldly to your throne. I throw myself by your feet. I want to dwell in your presence. dwell in your presence. I want to dwell in your presence. There's a song we love to sing. Your presence is heaven to me. Wherever you are is where I want to be. Wherever you are is where I want to be. Come on, I want you to pray this morning. That, Father, I seek your kingdom first. I seek you out. Everything that has to do with you is my priority. Where you are is where I want to be. Let me take this opportunity this morning to say that in this part of scripture, I almost want you to decide for yourself and be honest this morning, whether you're the Pharisee or you're the woman. The reason why it's important for us to look at this word is that whether you're the Pharisee or the woman, we both need to know the message in this part of scripture. Write this down if you're taking notes. You, the sinner, needs to know that Jesus came for you. You, the Pharisee, the one who can invite Jesus, the one who has some sort of relationship or access to him, you too need to know that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Now the next parts of scripture that I'm going to share with you applies to both. Sometimes we are the woman, the sinner, but we also take the standpoint of the Pharisee when we look at another sinner and feel that their sins are far more greater than ours. And sometimes we're the sinner who knows that everybody calls us the immoral one. Who knows that out of everyone's opinion, chances are we don't deserve to be where God is. But we as sinners also need to know the next part of scripture. I want you to write down 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 Timothy 1.15. It says, Christ came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, this saying is true. And this saying can be trusted. He says, this statement, the statement is Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then Paul says, this very saying, this very statement is true and can be trusted. He says, because I was the worst of all the sinners. 
Paul says, I was the worst of all the sinners. Now, this is something that's important for the sinner, the woman, and the Pharisee, that one that has proximity to Christ, to both know that the statement is true. The statement is true so much so for the women as it is for the Pharisee. I know that you and I like to separate and go, this statement is true about the one who's regarded as sinner. No, this statement is true just as much as it is for the woman. It is for the Pharisee. Paul says, I was the worst of all the sinners. Therefore, I can confidently confirm that this statement is true, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save the sinner. Why is it important for all of us to know this? So that our heart posture towards God always remains clear. We are them that have been forgiven of our sins. We are them that have been forgiven of our sins. Yes, I'm sitting in church on Sunday. I haven't been to church in 10 years. We are them that have been forgiven of our sins. Jesus came into the world to save the sinner. Write this down. Romans 5 verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. Let me put it like this. Even before she arrived to the dinner, even before she gay crashed the party, even before she came and broke her alabaster jar onto his feet, even before she wept and cried and wiped her tears with her hair and washed his feet, long before she heard that Jesus was in the neighborhood, Roman 5 verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, so even before you come with your alabaster box, I know you think that the alabaster box is what opened up the door. No, I came this morning to tell you that it's the very act of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins while you were on sinner that gives us access to this God. while we were sinners. I'm, I'm speaking to people who feel they've done way too much for God to love them. I'm speaking to people who feel that they, they, they are so dirty, so immoral, such sinners that they've done far too much that God can't love them. God says in Romans 5, 8, even while you were sinning, he was madly in love with you. Madly in love with you. This is important. For the Christian who's put themselves on the pedestal of thinking that they are better than others, forgetting God's grace that even while you were a sinner, even while they were a sinner, Jesus dies on the cross for all of our sins. Look at Luke 15 verse 2. Look at Luke 15 verse 2 the bible says and the pharisees and the scribes grumbled amongst themselves saying this man receives sinners and eats with them i love that luke 15 verse 2 describes what takes place at this house of the pharisee that God, or rather Jesus, is, is considered and known throughout scriptures as the one who receives sinners and eats with them. Isn't it ironic that he had an invitation from the Pharisee and he goes and eats with him, but also he receives the immoral woman who cries at his feet. Jesus is known for receiving sinners and eating with them. 
See, this was a difficult concept for the Pharisees to take. It's a difficult concept for us to take, to believe that God can transform people. That he loves them. That he's attentive and mindful of them. We, we love to hear that he is mindful of us, but we're not so comfortable with the idea of him being mindful of others. So this morning, whether you're the woman who is crying at Jesus' feet in desperate need of saving, Or you're the Pharisee who's got access to Jesus but has taken for granted the grace and mercy he's shown you. We all need to know that Christ came into this world to save. And I think we have an opportunity this morning to pray with a heart of gratitude. That thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins and for their sins. Thank you, Jesus Christ, that you didn't pick a few. Thank you that even the one who invited you and the one who's uninvited both have access to you. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you. Thank you for receiving me. Thank you. Thank you for dining with me. Thank you. Come on, I want you just to take time to thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for him washing our sins. Thank God for his loving kindness. Why is this important? Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. We have been given eternal life. Come on, go ahead and thank God for eternal life. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for eternal life. The Bible says it's a free gift. You didn't do anything to earn it. Oh, Pharisee, if you would just remember, you didn't do anything to have Jesus sitting in your house to eat. It wasn't because of your status. It wasn't because you've got great food. In fact, quite frankly, you have nothing to offer him. It's a free gift that he gives you to dine with you. Come on, write 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. It reads as follows. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance both the Pharisee and the woman Jesus is patient with see I want to take you to Luke 7 verses 39 and the Pharisee says if, if he really was a prophet he would know the kind of woman that is touching him she is a sinner and yesterday we spoke about how we get irritated at how God sometimes reacts to people we feel he should shun he should kick away and I want you to look at 2nd Peter verse 3 verse 9 it says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. He's not slow to transform their lives. He's not slow to offer salvation. He's not slow to love on them. He's not slow to transform them. 
but that the Lord is patient toward you. Like the Lord is patient towards the woman. Like the Lord is patient towards your estranged father. Like the Lord is patient towards the one who did you wrong. He, he is kind and he is loving and he is merciful. See, the, the way God is responding, or Jesus is responding to the both of them. Both need his love. Both need his presence. Both, Jesus is mindful that he doesn't want either of them to perish. He doesn't want the Pharisee to perish. He doesn't want the immoral woman to perish. His intention is that both would come to a place of repentance, that both would receive his forgiving kindness, that both would realize his love for them. I want you to look at John, 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, that God is faithful. See, see, if we confess our sins, God is faithful. God is faithful to the Pharisee just as much as he is faithful to the woman. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This applies to everyone. This applies to the person who did you wrong, unfortunately. I know it's not an easy thing to hear. This applies to the person you don't quite like. This applies to the person who betrayed you. This applies to the person you, you don't want to ever see again. This applies to the person you are harboring unforgiveness to. See, this grace is afforded to all of us. If we confess our sins, and oftentimes we see people confess their sins, the Pharisee, you watch a woman cry before Christ and your only concern about them is that they're sinners. You fail to see that he is faithful and just to forgive their sins. It's no wonder Jesus says, Simon, do you see this woman? Look at this woman. Look at her again. I know you just see a sinner, but I see one who comes with a repented heart. I see one who comes with a repentant heart. Why? Because he is faithful and just to forgive. This message this morning is for one who considers themselves one who has proximity to God and one who may feel this morning that they are the woman in question. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of his glory. All have sinned and fall short of his glory. Jesus responds to Simon and says, These two have both loaned money, one for 500 pieces of silver the other for 50 pieces of silver but the one thing that is the same with both of them is that they both can't repay so it doesn't matter whether it's 500 or 50 pieces of silver they both are in debt we all have sinned we all fall short of his glory If he was a prophet, he would know that the woman touching him is a sinner. If he was a prophet, he would know that the one who's invited him is a sinner. We all fall short of his glory. Yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That person you have no regard for, Jesus died for. That person you don't wish well for, Jesus died for. We all are in desperate need of him. I want you to look at 
Psalms 51. We're going to close here. Just open to Psalms 51. We'll look at verse 12 to 17. We'll pray and we'll leave it here. From about verses 54 and 55 of Luke 7. After Jesus tells the story, he, he brings it back home to what is taking place in the house. He says, look at her. He says, do you see her, Simon? You've taken this high moral stand of knowing and calling out who's a sinner and who's not a sinner. But, but I want you to look at her. And then Jesus starts to paint a picture of what's taking place in the room. He says, when I entered your home that you invited me into, you didn't offer me water to wash my feet. Yet she comes and she washes my feet with her tears and her hair. Jesus says, you didn't kiss me. We said yesterday that the kissing when greeting was customary culture in that time to greet someone was to show friendship and acceptance. And Jesus says, you didn't even greet me. But she has kissed my feet ever since she's arrived here. Jesus says, you didn't even take common olive oil that is readily available for me to anoint my head but she has taken this rare perfume and she has poured it all over my feet. Jesus paints a picture of a sinner and of a Pharisee who has access and says, she's done all of these things and you who has access to me has not offered me. Then he goes on to say, she has shown me love. Then he goes on to say, her sins are forgiven. Her heart of repentance, her cry and weeping. God says, Jesus says, I've heard and her sins are forgiven. I want you to look at Psalms 51. And I'm now speaking to us Pharisees. Us who go around feeling that God shouldn't be forgiving everyone. That some people deserve the worst. They don't deserve God's mercy. They don't deserve God's grace. In Psalms 51 verses 12 and 17, the Bible says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. This is David speaking. And make me willing to obey you. Make me willing to wash your feet. Make me willing to kiss you when you arrive. Make me willing to give you olive oil. Make me willing to see you in your space. Make me willing to obey you. Then watch this. Then I will teach your ways to the rebels. And they will return to you. Forgive me for the shedding of blood. Oh God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O oh Lord, that my mouth may praise you. I want us to pray this morning that God will restore the joy of his salvation. I want to read it this morning in the TPT. Same part of scripture. Psalms 51 verses 12 to 17. It reads as follows. Let my passion for life be restored. Let my passion for you, O God be restored Rejo re restore to me the joy D let it not be found that you are in my midst and i fail to passionately love on you to passionately live out my salvation to passionately seek your face to passionately knock at your door to passionately walk with you to passionately read and study the word to show myself approved to you let my passion for life be restored tasting joy in every breakthrough you bring me to hold me close to you with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say lord make me sensitive to your presence Make me sensitive to your will. Make me sensitive to your ways. Make me sensitive to your kingdom. Make me sensitive to your holiness, to righteousness, 
Hold me close with a willing spirit. Let me be willing to participate in the things of God. Verse 13, then... See, the problem with the Pharisee and the woman is that he was not living out the first part of the scripture. He didn't have a willing and obeying spirit. He, he, he forgot who was in his home. He still wasn't sure on who Jesus was. He, 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 he was so engulfed in himself that he, he, he was not restored to the joy of salvation. He was not sensitive to God. He was not sensitive to Jesus being in his midst. Listen to this. Then I can show other guilty ones how loving and merciful you are. If he was functioning at this level, when the woman arrived and fell at Jesus' feet, he wouldn't be having conversations in his mind about whether or not Jesus is who he says he with, whether or not Jesus is responding in the way that he thinks Jesus should be responding. No, he would see this as an opportune time for Jesus to do what Jesus does best, and that is to embrace the ones he loves and to offer them salvation and forgiveness. He says, then I can show other guilty ones, meaning I too am guilty. I can show other guilty ones how loving and merciful you are. I am the prime example to show them that you forgive sins. I am the prime example to show them that you are loving. I'm the prime example to show them that even with all your immorality, even if with all your sins, it is still possible for you to fall at Jesus' feet. Look at me to see that it is possible. And then I can show other, the other guilty ones how loving and merciful you are. Then they will find their way back home to you, knowing that you will forgive them. How will they find their way back to God? Because we are witnesses that he is a saving and a loving God. See, the fact that he has saved us and forgiven us doesn't give us a moral high standing. No, we are the display of God's grace. Why is it important for us to live in this reality so they too can see how loving and merciful God is? I know you walking around with your shoulders and chest pumped up because you've been saved for so long. And you look at others who are stumbling at their sin and you look down on them. No, God has intended that because he has saved you, others will see that it is possible for God to save them. We are witnesses of his kindness, of his love and his mercy. We are not meant to live out God's grace as thinking that we are better or higher than others. And he says in verse 14, oh God, my saving God, don't forget that God saved you. Deliver me fully from every sin. Don't forget that even though you've got proximity to God, that by nature we are sinful, never stop having a repented heart. Never stop having a heart that seeks after his will. Never stop having a heart that seeks after righteousness. Never stop having a heart that is quick to acknowledge unholiness in and around your life. He says, deliver me from every sin. Then my heart will once again be thrilled to sing the passionate songs of joy and deliverance. Don't stop singing the songs of joy and deliverance. Oh God, you are good. Oh God, you are kind. Oh God, you are merciful. How you saved me. How you gave me life. You've given me eternal life. How you've loved on me. How you've showered me with your presence. Don't stop singing the songs of joy and repentance. Then he says, Oh Lord, unlock my heart. Let my heart not forget your mercies. Let my heart not forget the benefits. Let my heart not forget your forgiveness, your kindness. Unlock my lips. Let my mouth never stop or cease to give you praise, to give you honor. Let my lips never get tired of kissing your feet. 
and I will overcome with my joyous praise. For the source of your pleasure is not in my performance. O oh, Pharisee, the pleasure is not from the performance, but it says all the sacrifice that I might offer you. Then it says in verse 17, the fountain of your pleasure is found in the sacrifice of my shattered heart before you. The fountain of your pleasure is found in the sacrifice of my shattered alabaster box by your feet. By the weeping and the wiping of the tears with my hair. It's the brokenness of repentance. And it continues to say, you will not despise my tenderness. As I bow humbly at your feet. Come on, it's a prayer of repentance this morning. That, oh Lord, unlock my heart. Unlock my lips, may I never stop singing the songs of your joy and your deliverance. May I never forget your kindness towards me. May my heart never be closed off to others who don't know you. May the pursuit be to tell others how loving and how merciful You saved me. You delivered me. Oh, you loved me. You forgave me. You embraced me. You received me. You gave me eternal life. I'm grateful. May I never forget your mercy. May I never forget your love. May my heart never be hardened to others experiencing the same grace, others receiving the same love, others receiving eternity, others receiving your love. May my heart not be hardened towards you forgiving and loving others. May I never forget the mercy you've shown me. May my life forever be an example that even the worst of worst you forgive, even the worst of worst you use, even the worst of worst you transform, even the greatest of sinners you give new life, Ooh. even the greatest of sinners you know how to embrace, even the greatest of sinners can sit at your feet, even the greatest of sinners can receive forgiveness from you. Father, may we never forget that their intention, the mandate, the cry of your heart is souls. That we, Lord God, should know that your heart is that neither of us should perish. Even the one that is watching this morning feeling like they are the sinner. Your, your intent is for them not to perish. Even the one who feels they're better than others. Your intent for them is not to perish. Eternal life is what you want for all of us. May we never stop to sing the songs of joy and deliverance. We are the ones who've been delivered. Our lives are a daily witness that God loves and saves. He loves and saves. Woo! The forgotten ones, he loves and saves. The neglected ones, he loves and saves. The rejected ones, he loves and saves. The sinners, he loves and saves. The ones with a past, he loves and saves. May we never stop to sing the songs of joy and it delivers. David says, so that I will show the guilty ones how loving and merciful you are. May we never stop. 
to declare his goodness, his kindness, his mercy towards us. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. We're out of time. Father, we pray this morning. And we thank you for your saving grace. We thank you that you came into this world to save us. Thank you that you love us that much. We pray this morning, Lord God, that our hearts will turn towards you. That we never forget how you saved us. How you daily show us mercy, how you daily show us grace. As we start the day, Lord God, we speak your protection. Speak your covering, but most importantly, Lord God, we speak awareness. That in every breath we take, we are conscious of how you have saved us. And that in turn, Lord God, we will live our lives in such a way that will show others that you truly do save, you truly do love, you truly do forgive, and you truly do transform. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, we're out of time. I've got to go. You've got to go. Have a great and blessed time. Sukunda Pumalanga, if you're around the Sukunda area, if it's an hour drive or 30 minutes drive, we want to encourage you to pull through tomorrow. We're going to be out in Sukunda. It's Jesus, this, Jesus, that. We just want to come and pray and trust God for souls. We want to come and speak the word of God. We want to come and fellowship with you. So we want to encourage you to come through and spend time with us tomorrow. Uh, bring a blanket, bring something warm, something comfortable. Uh, you know, put your sweats on. You know, some of you come to Jesus, as Jesus that looking so cute. When it's time for us to kneel and pray, you're thinking of your gene now. No. Come as you are. We're going to have a great time in God's presence. Come ready to hear his word. Come expectant. But most importantly, come ready to pray. And um, we are excited. So keep praying for us, other parts of the country, um, that God gives us strength and the ability and the resources to make it to you as well. But I want us to really pray for the province of Mpumalanga tomorrow. And pray for those specific areas that God will really come through and answer and move in a way uh, that we can't even imagine. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. And that's what we're trusting and believing God for. So yes, um, we're excited. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, God bless. Have a fantastic weekend. Don't stop to sing the songs of joy and deliverance. Until then, God bless you.